Happy Halloween, everybody. I like your masks. Give it up for my dear friend, Mr. Stevie Wonder. That's the original Motown sound. I miss you too. That's why I came back. I love you back. We've got a great crew in your corner here in Michigan. Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist. Mayor Mike Duggan. Senator Debbie Stabenow. A man who's always fighting for you when you need him. You got to send him back to the Senate. Gary Peters. Three outstanding Congresswomen who need to be sent back to the House. Brenda Lawrence, Elisa Slotkin, and Haley Stevens. And you also have the next President of the United States, Joe Biden. Come on. Come on. Three days, Detroit. Three days. Three days until the most important election of our lifetimes. And that includes mine, which was pretty important. <laughs> this Tuesday, everything is on the line. Our jobs are on the line. Health care is on the line. Whether we get this pandemic under control is on the line. And the good news is, on Tuesday, you can choose change. You can elect Joe Biden. You can elect Kamala Harris. You can choose a better America. And you don't have to wait until Tuesday to cast your ballot, Michigan. Because here in Michigan, you can vote in person right now. Go to IWillVote.com, find your polling place, go vote. If you've already voted, then what do you do? Go get your friends to vote. Get your family to make a plan to vote. We need everybody to turn out. This is a family affair. Detroit, Joe Biden is my brother. I love Joe Biden. He will be a great president. I'll admit, 12 years ago, when I asked him to serve as the nominee for vice president, I didn't know him all that well. We had served in the Senate together, but he had been there a while. I was still fairly new. He and I came from different places. We came from different generations. But I came to admire Joe as a man who is decent to his core, a man who learned early on to treat everybody with dignity and everybody with respect, somebody who lived by the words his mom taught him. No one's better than you, Joe, but you're no better than anybody else. And that decency, that empathy, that belief that everybody counts, that's really who Joe is. And the good news is, that's who he'll be when he's president. Because, because I, I can tell you something, the presidency doesn't actually change who you are. It just reveals who you are. And I saw who Joe was. And I saw how seriously he took the work. And I saw how critical it was from his perspective to make sure that the voices of ordinary families were in the room when decisions were being made. And for eight years, Joe was the last one in the room whenever I faced a big decision. He made me a better president. He's got the character and experience to make us a better country. And he and Kamala are going to be in the fight, not for themselves, but for every single one of us. And you know what? You can't, you can't say that about the president we got right now. I, I mean, look, I, I knew Donald Trump wasn't going to agree with me, that he wasn't going to embrace my vision. I understood he wasn't going to continue my policies. But I did hope that he was going to show some interest in taking the job seriously. Right? I mean, if, if you get elected president, if you run for president and you become president, the assumption is you are going to take the job seriously. That you're going to understand the solemn obligation when you are sworn in office. 
But he never took it seriously. He, did, he, he hasn't shown any interest in just doing the work or helping anybody but himself or his friends or treating the presidency as anything more than a reality show to give him the attention that he craves so desperately. And the rest of us have had to live with the consequences. Almost 230,000 Americans have died. More than 100,000 small businesses have closed. Almost 300,000 jobs are gone in Michigan alone. America just had its single worst week of new cases. We've been living with this thing for months now. And we just had the worst week in terms of incidents. And in the face of that, what is Donald Trump's closing argument? No, he says the people are too focused on COVID. COVID, 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 he's complaining. He's jealous of COVID's media coverage. But, but that's not enough. Now he's starting to accuse doctors of profiting off of this pandemic. He actually said this. He said, they're making a big deal out of it so they can make more money. Who says that? Here, you've got doctors who are risking their lives to save other people, who have to, every time they go in and then they come home, they have to completely isolate themselves, remove all their protective garments, shower, scrub, do everything just to make sure their own families don't get sick. In some cases, don't get to see their families. And he's saying they're doing that to make a buck. He can't fathom that somebody would be willing to make sacrifices for others unless there was some economic motivation. That's how he thinks. And now we've got his chief of staff saying, <laughs> he, he said this on TV said, we're not going to control the pandemic. I just, just flat out just said, we're not going to control it. We noticed. <laughs> yes, you're right. And that's why we've got to have Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in the White House, because you're not going to control the pandemic. I, yeah, they, they just got kind of like a... I guess I'm dating myself. You guys remember Mad Magazine, the older people do. Remember, and then you got, had Alfred E. Newman? Remember, he had that big grin, funny looking dude, ears like mine. And he used to say, what me worry? Oh, he didn't worry about anything. That's, that's how these guys are. What, what, why should I be worried? The same way, you remember when Republicans were saying, let Detroit go bankrupt. You remember that? And now they might as well just be saying, let America get COVID. It's not our problem. You're exaggerating it. That's what they are literally saying every day. Listen, if Trump were focused on COVID from the beginning, cases wouldn't be reaching new record highs across the country. And, and, and some of the places he's holding rallies have seen new spikes after he leaves town. He's going around having events, big events, no masks, no protective gear, no, no precautions. What's his obsession with crowds anyway? I mean, he's still worrying. He's, he is still talking about his inauguration crowd being small. Although he doesn't admit it. Does he have nothing better to worry about? That was four years ago. I mean, what kind of trauma did he go through? Did, did no one come to his birthday parties when he was a kid? Is, is, is Fox News not giving him enough attention? Lord. And that's the difference between Joe Biden and, and, and Donald Trump right there. Trump cares about feeding his ego. Joe cares about keeping you safe and your family safe and getting this country moving again. And that's why you've got to make sure that every single one of you vote. Look, th this pandemic would have been challenging for any president. But this idea that somehow this White House has done anything but completely screw this up, well, the facts tell, 
say otherwise. Canada, right across the way. Used to be you could go there, remember? Can't go right now. It turns out this administration was building a wall to keep us in by bungling this pandemic. Canada identified its first case the same week that the U.S. did. The same, the same week. Our mortality rate, the number of people who die per capita, is two and a half times higher. If we had the same mortality rate as they do, then around 90,000 Americans would have died, which would still be a tragedy, but it wouldn't be 230,000. If we had handled this pandemic like Canada did, 140,000 of our fellow Americans might still be alive today. That's, that's, that's a sign of how much leadership in the White House matters. It matters. This is not a game. This is not a contest of, of just, you know, calling each other names. This isn't a sporting event. This is life or death. And last week, when, when Donald Trump was asked, would you do anything differently? He said, not much. Not much. Not really can't think. You can't think of anything you'd do differently? I, look, there, there is not a thing I did as president where I didn't look back and say, man, I could have done that a little bit better. I, I could have done it. Even the stuff that worked. He can't think of one thing? Not one thing. Not one thing. Oh, Lord. Look, I, I, I understand this is a president who wants full credit for the econ economy he inherited and gets zero blame for the pandemic he ignored, but the job doesn't work that way. Tweeting at the TV doesn't fix things. Making stuff up doesn't make people's lives better. You've got to have a plan. You've got to do the work. And along with the experience to get things done, Joe Biden has concrete plans and policies that will turn our vision of a better, fairer, stronger country into reality. Joe Biden is not going to screw up testing. He's not going to call scientists idiots. He's not going to host super spreader rallies around the country or in the White House. Joe will get this pandemic under control with a plan to make testing free and widely available and get a vaccine to every American cost free and make sure our frontline heroes Never have, to, never have to ask other countries for the equipment that they need. His plan will guarantee paid sick leave for workers and parents affected by the pandemic and make sure that the small businesses that hold our communities together and employ millions of Americans can reopen safely. Small businesses in every community, not just some communities, not just big corporations. Yeah, Donald, Donald Trump likes to claim he built this economy. America created 1.5 million more jobs in the last three years of the Obama-Biden administration than in the first three years of the Trump-Pence administration. That's a fact. That was before he could blame the pandemic. Joe Biden and I worked to rescue the auto industry. Gary Peters was there. Debbie Stabenow was there. Gary Peters understood what was at stake. He told us to bet on Michigan, and we did. And manufacturing grew in Min Michigan by 15 percent over our final four years in office. Donald Trump came in. He said, I'm going to make Michigan the manufacturing hub of the world. It's up 1 percent under his first four years. 15. 15 to 1. We handed him the longest streak of job growth in American history. But the economic damage that he's inflicted by botching the pandemic response means he'll be the only president since Herbert Hoover to actually lose jobs. Herbert Hoover, that's the 30s. That's a long time ago. There have been a lot of presidents since Herbert Hoover. He'll be the first one to lose jobs during his presidency. Joe Biden and Gary Peters know that the key to a strong economy, it's not tax, tax cuts for billionaires. It's lifting the prospects of working Americans. 
And Joe's got a plan to create one million new auto-related jobs by accelerating electric vehicle production. He's going to create 10 million good, clean energy jobs to fight climate change and secure environmental justice. And he's going to pay for it by rolling back Trump's tax cuts for billionaires. Joe Biden, he, Joe Biden sees this as a moment not just to get back to where we were. He wants to build on the progress we made during our administration, and he wants to take it further. He wants to make long overdue changes so that our economy actually works for everybody, makes life a little easier for everybody. The waitress trying to raise a kid on her own. The student trying to figure out how to pay for next semester's classes. The shift worker always on the edge of getting laid off. The cancer survivor who's worried about her pre-existing uh, conditions protections being taken away. Love you, appreciate you. I really do. And I'm grateful. Listen, let's talk about health care for a second. Republicans love to say right before an election, they'll protect your pre-existing conditions. Right? Joe and I actually protected them 10 years ago with the Affordable Care Act. We didn't get Republican votes, not one. And Republicans have tried to repeal or undermine the Affordable Care Act more than 60 times. Uh, why they want to take people's health care away is not clear to me. I don't know why you'd, you'd have that kind of spirit say, you know what, I want to make sure that, peop that person doesn't have health care. I don't know why they would think that way. And when they're asked about it, they say, no, 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 we're going to repeal it, but we're going to replace it with something even better, even bigger, more beautiful. They've promised a new plan for 10 years now. No plan. No plan. For, for two years, when this new president came into office, he had a Republican Congress. Could have passed this beautiful new plan. Didn't happen. They still don't have a plan. When they're asked about it, everybody, nobody can find it. They're looking around. It's the same place they put the pandemic playbook that we gave them to tell them how to deal with a pandemic. It's lost. It's gone. Missing. Instead, they just attacked the Affordable Care Act at every turn. Driving up costs, driving up the uninsured. Now they've got a case. I'm not going to stand on the What kind of, what kind of? No, no. Stop.
Just have an empty promise to take its place. You've got Mitch McConnell pouring millions of outside super PAC dollars into Michigan to try to beat Gary Peters, but Detroit, Joe, and Kamala and Gary will protect your health care. They will expand Medicare. They'll make insurance more affordable for everybody, and they will make sure that our health care workers and our frontline workers have the protections they need. If you vote. Now here, here, here's one other thing that's important. You know, Joe and Kamala, when they're in the White House, you won't have to just think about them every day. They won't be trying to get your attention every day. You're not going to have to just shake your head and slap your forehead every day. It, it won't be so exhausting. You will be able to go about your lives knowing that the president is working. And you're not going to have to worry about a president who suggests that maybe we inject bleach as a cure for COVID. You won't have a president who's retweeting conspiracy theories that Navy SEALs didn't actually kill bin Laden. We won't have a president who's going to go out of his way to insult anybody who doesn't agree with him. You, you want to make stuff, stuff up every, every day? day. Multiple, Multiple times, times a day. Probably doing it right now as we speak. It is not normal behavior. We would not tolerate it from a high school principal. We wouldn't tolerate it from a coach. We wouldn't tolerate it from a co-worker. Can you imagine if, if you were working with somebody and they just lied every day at a certain point, you'd be like, you know what, we, uh, yeah, we would fire him. Why would we accept this from the President of the United States? Because there are consequences to this. There are consequences to his actions. They embolden people to be mean and divisive and racist and appraise the fabric of our society and our lives. It affects how our children see things and how they interact. It affects the way our families get along. It affects the way the world looks at America. That's why Joe talks about the soul of America. And that's more than anything is what separates him from his opponent. He cares about every American, not just some. And he cares about the values that make this country exceptional. I know Joe Biden. He does not have a mean-spirited, 
bone in his body. He cares about everybody's story. He wants to hear everybody's voice. He tries to live by the, the values that we cherish. Honesty and hard work, kindness and humility, responsibility, helping out somebody who's having a hard time. You know, when I, when I hear this, this kind of phony, macho, you know, acting tough, snarling all the time, that, that, that's, not, that's, not, that's not what it used to be to, to, to be a man, a father, a leader. You didn't go around bragging all the time. You didn't go around putting other people down. And Joe understands that. And when you elect Joe, that's what you'll see reflected in the White House. And these shouldn't be Republican values or Democratic values. They're what, our, they're what our parents taught us, what our grandparents taught us. It's what we still try to pass on to our kids. They're not white values or black values or Lat Latino or Asian or Native American values. They're American values. And we have to reclaim them. But to do that, we're going to have to turn out like never before. To reclaim what's best in this country, we can we can leave no doubt. We cannot afford to be complacent. Not this time. Not in this election. Last time we were complacent, some of us. Some of us said, eh, you know, I don't need to bother voting. And listen, I understand why Americans get frustrated sometimes. They think government might not make a difference. But government's not perfect. Elected officials, even the best, aren't perfect. It, you know, it, Government's not going to solve every problem, but, but it can make things better. A president can't solve every economic problem by himself, but if we elect people like Gary Peters and, and Brenda Lawrence and, and uh, Alyssa Slotkin and Haley Stevens, and we get a House and a Senate that's more focused on working people and getting you the help you need, we can make things better. It can make a difference. Some more folks will get jobs. Some young people will get more opportunity. Some folks will be able to afford a college education. Some folks will be able to go to and, and get an apprenticeship and, and, and get a trade. You know, a, a president by himself can't eliminate all racial bias in our criminal justice system. Electing me didn't, didn't end. It didn't make us post-racial. But you know what? It, it can if we elect district attorneys and state's attorneys and sheriffs focused on equality and justice, and we have a justice department that reinvigorates the civil rights division, it can make things better. And then maybe some folks won't be subject to some of the tragedies that we've seen over these last few months. And that's what voting's about. It's not about making things perfect. It's about making things better. And better's good putting us on track so that a generation from now we can look back and say, you know what, right about then we turned the corner and we started back on a better trajectory. The fact that we don't get 100% of what we want is not a good reason not to vote. It's a reason to keep voting until we do get it right. You know, on average, just over 50% of us vote, 50%. You, you, you've got almost half of eligible voters not voting. And, and so those are some of the same folks complaining. But imagine if 60% of us voted. Imagine if 70% of us voted. Imagine January 20th. And we swear in a president and a vice president who have a plan to get us out of this mess, who care about working Americans, and have a plan to help you start getting ahead who believe in science, who have a plan to protect this planet for our kids, who believe in racial equality, and are willing to do the work to bring us closer to an America where no matter what we look like or where we come from or who we love or how much money we got, everybody's got dignity. Everybody's treated with respect. Everybody's got a chance to raise a family. Michigan, that can happen. And I'm asking you to remember what this country can be. The thing is, though, we can't just imagine a better future. 
We've got to fight for it. We got to out hustle the other side. We got to get to work. We got to vote up and down the ticket like never before. We've got to leave no doubt about who we are and what this country stands for. And if we do, we will send Gary Peters back to the Senate. We'll send Brenda Lawrence and Alyssa Slotkin and Hallie, Hallie Stevens back to the House. And we will elect a man who loves this country, who cares about you, who will fight for every single one of us. My friend, a real leader, the next president, of the United States of America. Joe Biden! Well, hello. Hello, Detroit. It's good to be with so many friends. Mayor Duggan, you're one hell of a mayor, man. Spent a lot of time with you. The president gave me an easy assignment. He said, Detroit's in trouble. Get them what they need. Well, I tell you what, all I did was listen to what Duggan told me to do, and I did. And Gretchen Whitmer, Governor Whitmer, you are one quite great governor. And Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist, my buddy Debbie Stabenow, your once and future Senator Gary Peters. And you can always count on Gary to be there for you and your family, and that's a fact. And Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence, we need to send you back to the House, just like we need to send Hallie back, Hallie Stevens. And I tell you what, you know that Slotkin girl? She happens to be a Congress. Two things you got to know about her. She's forgotten more about the intelligence community, the CIA, than most people ever know. And the second thing you got to know is she's smarter than you. It's harder. And Stevie Wonder is here. Stevie's been a powerful voice for justice for a long time, and he's generally a national treasure. And of course, President Barack Obama. I tell you what, didn't it make you a little nostalgic just hearing him? Compared to, <laughs> compared, I won't even compare, God Almighty. It's great to see you, Mr. President. It's great to hang out with you. It reminds us that we can have a president with character decency, respect, a president respected around the world, the president our kids could and did look up to. I want to say something we don't say often enough. President Obama was a great president. And one of the great honors I had was not only serving with him, but becoming a good personal friend. Our families became close. My two granddaughters and two of his two daughters went all through school together, remained each other's best buddies. I want to make sure to say it here today, Mr. President, thank you. Thank you for everything, and thanks for reminding us what we can be again. Look, I want to start on a serious note here by extending my condolences to the Chaldean Assyrian community here in Michigan on the 10th anniversary of Our Lady of Deliverance Church massacre in Baghdad. I, I was there in Baghdad. I met with the Archbishop. I've been to Baghdad many, many times during the war. And I tell you what, they were worried back then 
And after it occurred, I came out here. Look, the right to worship is a fundamental right in America. And as Americans, we should be proud that people from all over the world find a home here in our communities, here in Michigan, where the right to vote is the most fundamental right and the right that protects our religious freedoms. And so my heart goes out to all those. Ten years seems like a long time, but not if you lost somebody. It's like yesterday. So you have my empathy, my sympathy, and my support. Well, Detroit, three days, three days, three days to put an end to a presidency that has divided this nation. Three days we can put an end to a presidency that has failed to protect this nation. Three days. We can put an end to a president that has fanned the flames of hate all across this nation. Millions of Americans have already voted. Over 85 million so far, they tell me. Millions more are going to vote in the days ahead because the president said we have to overwhelmingly vote and overwhelmingly win this thing. So my message is simple. The power to change the country is in your hands. I don't care how hard Donald Trump tries. There's nothing, nothing he's going to do to stop the people of America from voting. Nothing. And when Americans vote, we will be heard. And when America's heard, I believe the message is going to be loud and clear. It's time for Donald Trump to pack his bags and go home. As the president said, we're done with the chaos, with the tweets, with the anger, with the hate, with the failure, with the irresponsibility. Yeah. Folks, we got a lot of work to do. I don't really need you to get me elected. I need you once I'm elected. Because if I'm elected your president, we're going to get things done. We're going to act. We're going to move. We're going to move for all our families. We're going to act to get COVID under control. On day one of my presidency, we'll put into action a plan I've been talking about for months. Masking, social distancing, testing, tracing. Plan for full and fair and free distribution of therapeutics and vaccines when we get one. Imagine where we'd be if we had a president who had worn a mask instead of mocked it. I can tell you this. We'd have 9 million confirmed cases of COVID in this nation. 9 million. We wouldn't have 230,000 deaths. We wouldn't be seeing these new record numbers of cases we're seeing every single night now. Nearly 100,000 cases nationwide in the United States just yesterday. We wouldn't be facing another 200,000 predicted deaths in the next few months. This president knew in January this virus was deadly. Remember I kept saying, and another of us said, look, his intelligence community has briefed him and briefed him in detail. But what did he say? He said, no, I never read the reports. Well, that didn't surprise me, but it turns out he did. He knew, and he hid it from the American people. He knew it was so much worse than the flu. He lied to the American people. He knew it wasn't going to disappear, but he kept telling us, a miracle is coming. And just yesterday, he had the gall, as Brock said, to say that doctors, the people who have been on the front lines, some have given their lives along with nurses and others, first responders. He suggested these doctors were falsely inflating deaths due to COVID because they wanted to make money. What in the hell's the matter with this man? What's the matter with him? Look, the people of this nation have suffered and sacrificed for nine months, and none more so than our doctors on the front line, our health care workers. And this president is questioning their character, their integrity, and their commitment to their fellow Americans. It's more than offensive. It's a disgrace, especially coming from a president who's waved the white flag to this virus. Our frontline health workers, they've given all their best 
to beat this virus. Many of them have died. But they have a president. We have a president that's given up. I'll never raise the white flag of surrender. We're going to beat this virus. We're going to get it under control. And the first step of beating this virus is beating Donald Trump. Look, Trump keeps telling us what a great president he is, the stable genius, as you know. Well, did you know President Obama and I helped create more jobs, as he said, in the last three years of our administration than he did in the first year, three, three years of his, before the pandemic? Or how about this? Did you know Donald Trump is going to be the first president, as the president said, in 90 years? is going to finish his four years with fewer jobs under his leadership than he's when he started? That's a lot of presidents, man. A lot of crises. But only Trump is going to have fewer jobs at the end of his presidency than at the start. Look, you see, I understand something Donald Trump doesn't. Wall Street did not build this country. You did. People like my parents. Ordinary working people in this country. And unions built the middle class. That's a fact. Back when the economy was on the brink in 2009, when Detroit was on its back, Barack and I bet on auto workers. My dad was an automobile man. And over the objective of many, including Vice President Pence, we stepped in and rescued the automobile industry and saved at least one million jobs. But what you may not know is Congressman Hallie Stevens was on that task force to make sure we got it done. Look, where I come from, I believe we should be rewarding work, not wealth in this country. Work, not wealth. Under my plan, if you make more than less than $400,000, I guarantee you're not going to pay a penny more in taxes. But if you make more than that, the wealthiest, biggest corporations, the 91 Fortune 500 companies that paid zero income tax, you're going to start paying your fair share. <laughs> Folks, why should a firefighter, an educator, a nurse pay a higher tax rate than a billionaire? That's a fact, by the way. You're a nurse. If there's any if there's any angels in heaven, they're all nurses, male and female, man. All right. Well, God love you. I've been a significant consumer of health care, and I can tell you. I can tell you. The fact of the matter is that that this is God's truth. Doctors let you live. Nurses, male and female, make you want to live. They make you want to live. That comes from a guy who spent a lot of time in the hospital with two cranial aneurysms, a few other problems. Look, you should pay more. Why should all of you be paying more taxes than Donald Trump, the billionaire? He deducted, he has an income. He says he paid an income tax of $750. As they say in Southern Delaware, how about y'all? What'd you all pay? $750? My Lord. And remember when he was asked about why I only paid that much? It's because I'm smart. He knew how to game the system. Well, guess what, Mr. President? I'm coming for you. We don't game the system. And when the system gets gamed, you all have to pay. It's not right. It's not fair. And we're going to act. We're going to act to protect health care. Trump and the Republicans have jammed through a Supreme Court nomination. And you know why? One reason, to destroy the Affordable Care Act, to rip it out. If they get their way, 100 million Americans will lose protections for pre-existing conditions, including more than 4 million people here in Michigan. Donald Trump thinks health care is a privilege. Barack and I think it's your right. I'll not only restore Obamacare, we'll build on it. You can keep your private insurance or you can choose a Medicare-like option in the plan we're putting together. We'll increase subsidies and lower your premiums and deductibles. 
out-of-pocket spending, reduce prescription prices by 60 percent. The way we're going to do it is the wealthy are going to start paying their fair share so we can make sure you get a fair deal. We're going to make sure we keep the protections for people with pre-existing conditions. Meanwhile, Social Security, the actuary of the Social Security Administration said, if Donald Trump says, and he said, he's going to change Social Security if he gets reelected. He said if his plan goes through, it would bankrupt Social Security in 2023, by 2023. So go home and tell your parents or grandparents what a great gift is coming if he were to win. I'll protect Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. But folks, nothing worse to me than the way he's spoken about those who have served in uniform and those who have died. He called them losers and suckers. Well, my son, Bo Biden, won the Bronze Star, the Conspicuous Service Medal, spent a year in Iraq. He wasn't a loser. He was an American patriot. And I mean it. Just like your sons and daughters, your parents and grandparents. The president likes to portray himself as a tough guy, the macho man. But when the last time you saw a president of the United States literally being laughed at by the world leaders of the United Nations, when he got to speak, the entire UN laughed at him. When's the last time you saw a president of the United States attend a NATO meeting, being openly mocked by the leaders of the NATO countries, making fun of him? Tough guy, my, my word. And you can believe, and you can believe we have a, can you believe we have a president who's Vladimir Putin's puppy? Putin put bounties on the heads of American soldiers in Afghanistan. Trump spoke to him six times since he knew about that, and he's too scared to challenge him. Donald Trump is not strong, he's weak. He commands virtually no respect on the international stage. This is a president who not only doesn't understand sacrifice, he doesn't understand courage, physical courage, that it takes to wear that uniform. Maybe that's why six of his generals in his administration, who worked in the administration and since left, said he's unfit to be commander-in-chief of the United States military. That's why Joint Special Operations Commander Stanley McChrystal Commander Special Operations Command, who oversaw bin Laden's raid, Admiral Bill McRaven, and 22 other four stars have endorsed me, saying they'd be honored to have me as their commander in chief. That's why, because they know I will have the backs of the military wherever they are. Folks, look, folks. Well, by the way, you're right. The gentleman says, what about the 545 kids who were kidnapped? That's why I announced immediately on day one, I'm setting up a special commission. We're going to find those kids, and we're going to unite them with their parents. We're going to make sure their parents are together. What a total, what a total embarrassment. My God. That's why we have to support our military. That's why we have to vote for them. Look, folks, we will act to meet the climate crisis as well. The stable genius calls it a hoax. By the way, today he said he is a, I think he said, perfect physical specimen. <laughs> Maybe that's why he thought he was able to write off $70,000 on his taxes because he needed special hair care. Seriously, 70,000 bucks right written off for hair care. I tell you what, man, I hardly have any hair, but I'd rather have what I have. Stable, perfect specimen. Whoa. You know, we couldn't make this up, you know? I mean, think, I mean, think about it. I mean, this is, look. <laughs> well, I tell you what. Well, when I hear climate change, I see jobs. He says hoax. I see American workers building and installing 
500,000 charging stations across our highways in this country. I see American consumers switching to clean electric vehicles built here in Detroit and rebates for incentives. I see the federal government harnessing the purchasing power to buy clean electric vehicles for an enormous fleet that we have in, the, in Washington. They made and sourced by union jobs right here in America. This will mean one million good-paying jobs across America in the auto industry alone. Let's hear it for those honks of the cars out there who maybe think it's made here in Michigan. Look, and we'll act to deliver racial justice in America. Look, protesting is not burning or looting. Violence must never be tolerated, and it won't. But these protests are a cry for justice. The names of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Jacob Blake will not soon be forgotten because they will inspire a new wave of justice in America. Look, I believe this country has to come together. I'm running as a proud Democrat, but I will govern as an American president. I'll work as hard for those who don't support me as those, as those who do. And you know what? In this America, in my America, there's no red state or blue state. It's everybody. That's the job of a president, the duty to care, <clears throat> to care for everyone. So for God's sake, please vote. If you still have an absentee ballot, get it to drop off of the box, the drop box as soon as you can. You can also vote early until Monday afternoon, or you can vote on Election Day. But just make a plan. Make a plan to vote. As has been re repeated many times tonight, go to IWillVote.com slash MI. Folks, I'll never forget the words that my colleagues in the Senate used to kid me when I'd always remind them of it. The words President Kennedy said as he promised to send us to the moon. He said, we're doing it because we refuse to postpone. Well, I refuse to postpone the incredible opportunities that the American people have available to them. There's nothing beyond our capacity. There's no limit to America's future. The only thing that can tear America apart is America itself. And that's exactly what Donald Trump's been trying to do from the very beginning of his campaign, dividing America, pitting Americans against one another based on race, gender, ethnicity, national origin. It's wrong. It's not who we are. Look, folks, everybody knows who Donald Trump is. Let's show them who we are. <laughs> we choose. We choose hope over fear. We choose unity over division. We choose science over fiction. And yes, we choose truth over lie after lie after lie after lie. So it's time to stand up. Take back our democracy. We can do this. We're so much better than we've been. We can be who we are at our best, the United States of America. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you. Thank